cameras, if you ever want to, you can come back and look at this later because it's live streaming to our YouTube channel and our Facebook page. So you can go back and say, what did he say about that? And it'll be, you can, you can verify the facts afterwards, no pressure. Uh, but you can see that, or if you're, if you're traveling through the Panama Canal and you want to tune in back home and learn how to grow tomatoes, you can, you can live stream it from the ship as you're going through the Panama. But anyway, it's there. It gets, gets a lot of traction. So we got these fancy new cameras that track you. It just kind of keeps track so I never go out of frame. The problem is you've got all these fancy hand signals to tell it what to do. And it, I talk with my hands. And so I'm not signaling the camera. I'm just animated talking to my friends. And so I tend to derail the camera sometimes. Technology. When it works, it's great. When it doesn't, gosh, it bites. So anyway. Okay, so we are live. I'm glad you all are tuned in. Uh, there, welcome to the class today. Front row seat. So today's garden class is on tomatoes and herbs. Actually, vegetables and herbs. It's too soon to plant tomatoes in the back. It's too soon to plant tomatoes. So we're going to cover all that. I want to cover bugs, soils, uh, the plants, the calendars, when to put things, frost dates. We're going to cover all that in about 50 minutes. Okay, so this is a big class. We'll probably have to wait to the end for, for questions, or we just won't get through it all. And then if you're a note taker, I have the detailed notes coming to you in, a, in, in your inbox. I've got three handouts for you how to grow tomatoes, the vegetable calendar, and one other thing. Okay, who is that? I told you to turn your phones off. Who was that? I want to see. Raise your hand. Oh, the cowboy in the back. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I know. Oh, my gosh. All you ranchers are the same. Uh, no, just kidding. To the, other ranch, to the ranchers over here, just kidding. Him, him not. Anyway, uh, where was I even at? But before we start, okay, we got handouts coming. I'll send that out to you. If you want that, put your email here, and I will send that to you by the end of the day. You have three handouts, uh, PDF form, so you'll be able to open it up on your phone, your laptop, wherever you want. It's in a form that you can open up on any technology. Um, and then if you could do me a favor, some of you have appalling handwriting. So if you could, put your first name and your last name there. Not that I'm tracking you, but... You, you'd be surprised how I can interpret what your email address is by that name. I, I love you folks who are like flowerqueen at gmail.com. I like those, but usually it's first and last name and, and a date or something. Uh, just try to write clearly if you can so I can interpret, so I can send that to you. So we'll start here. If you don't want that, fine. Now, if you're part of our garden club, there's about 11,000 of you that like to get the weekly garden column that I write, okay? It, this is not going to everyone. This is only going to you all if you put your email address down. So if you're already part of the club, you put it down again saying that you want the handouts. Does that make sense? Just write clearly because I got to, my eyesight's not what it used to be and my typing's sometimes like this. It just helps me, okay? Before we get started though, I want to introduce a friend. Ken, come on up here. Ken Phil, so we're, we, we have this philosophy at Waters Gardens. This is our family thing. Uh, welcome, my friend. It's good to see you. So uh, um, we, we call it, do I even go that deep into things? I won't. But we are a for-profit company. But we're not after profit. We're about community, building relationships. This is a legacy business, 62 years in business. This is how we do it. We're ne neighbors and friends. We see each other at restaurants and you know, we talk to the chef because they're friends and they're gardeners. And so we're trying to build up nonprofits that we love. Ken Feld represents Tag for Life. It's a medical, it's a way for you to travel. And if you have an accident or something happens, they're going to ask you what your meds are. It's all just right there, easily accessed for first responders. With that, I'm not going to steal your thunder. I'll just give it to you. You can take five minutes or whatever. And they've got a table downstairs that hey, bring you and your staff. We want to introduce this to the area, uh, and we you should get a tag. It's it's an easy uh, uh, like credit card size thing you put in your wallet. It tracks all of your data. So if you're traveling to the Panama Canal, yeah, there we go. Okay, sorry, yeah, go Ken. Yeah, it's an exciting nonprofit. <laughs> Yeah. 
that sort of thing. Here, yeah. just so folks online can hear you too, because this is live stream. Yeah. Figure out what to do with it. <laughs> um, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer in 2020, and then in October had a liver transplant. So I'm an organ recipient as well as a cancer survivor. We started Tag for Life, and all of us who are a part of the organization are solid organ transplant recipients or cancer survivors. For us, having medical IDs are essential. So if something happens to, to us, first responders have to know what we're taking and what our medicines are and what our conditions are. But it goes further than that. People with diabetes, allergies, asthma, whatever high blood pressure, need to let first responders know what their conditions are in case there's an emergency. So we started Tag for Life, and what we have is a medical ID card that with a QR code. So at any time, you can scan it. You can scan it, first responder can scan it, and all of your medical information will show up. Who your emergency contact is, what medicines you're on, what your condition is. Anything that you want to put in your profile is available and accessible 24 hours a day, seven days a week, wherever you are. And it's completely up to you. So it's you can change it, you can add to it, you can change your prescriptions. There, whether you're allergic to NSAIDs or allergic to a bee stick, having this information available can be life-saving. So that's what we do. Um, we, we're providing them, we have a table out front, we're providing them free. Simply ask if you're willing to make a donation to help us. Our, our mission is to provide these to the medically vulnerable and socially disadvantaged people in our community. And so we're reaching out to all, all community members to help in our cause. And as a result, we'd like to protect each one of you. Is there anybody in the group that has asthma or diabetes or you have just won yourself an ID card. <laughs> so, so as I walk out and we'll get your profile set up and we have one, have one for you. We also have available in, in a wristband format that has the QR code inside it as well. So we have all sorts of IDs, but the, the main one is, is the wallet card. And Ken, I thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to come in and share our story and share what we do. And if, if you guys could help us out and come get a, get a card and help us, we'd greatly appreciate it. Okay. I will thank take you the much. microphone back. You bet. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, Kim. So Ken stayed at her house last night, kind of came in the day before and uh, showing me the, the details of that. It's, it's impressive. Take a look at what they've got going on. Uh, I think all of us, I mean, if the doctor would ask me what, med, what meds I'm on, it's just thyroid and statin like all of us. I could tell you how many milligrams, whatever. I don't know. I don't remember. So I'm like, without the bottle, I just can't, but it's all right there. Just, just list it. So it's, it's a good program. Um, cancer survivor, you can hear his story. It's a miracle. God is real. He can share that with you. It's an amaz amazing story. Okay, so that, enough for Tags for Life. Glad you guys tuned in. Hey, maybe you could put in their website, Tags for Life, so you could just hit the button and... Uh, oh, you did. My daughter is so smart. <laughs> She's so good. This, these youngsters with technology, they're so doggone good. Okay, so my name's Ken. Hi. I'm the owner. This is the other owner. She's the next generation. I'm second generation owner. How does Ken and Mackenzie Lane come to own Waters Garden Center? Well, her grandfather was Harold Waters. And Harold Waters had four very pretty daughters. And I took a liking to the youngest and I think prettiest blonde gal down there. You'll see her working here too. Her name's Lisa. So that's kind of the family business. We have farmed all over the county. We have gardened everywhere. We kind of, we've learned a couple things. And you learn gardening by killing stuff. That's the only way we truly took, that's the only way to learn, really. And so you, it's a social thing. So we're trying to help each other, not make as many mistakes, but truly. So my goal today is just to get you to kill a little bit less and get a couple steps going in the right direction. That's the goal, okay? So, and I think I can help you a little bit. The first things we need to, to cover are frost dates. Our frost date, now the locals use Mother's Day as the last, as a demarcation line for the last frost. Generally, nature reads the list and says, okay, we'll stop freezing here, but I've seen it snow well into May. You just need to be ready. And so uh, you'll be tempted if you're from San Diego or Palm Springs or Phoenix or 
the desert tropical areas, you are really tempted to go, go after it. If you're from Alaska, Midwest, you're thinking it just slowly warms up. And, you know, once the frost is done, yeah, we can start planting now. No, it violently gets warm and cold. It just does this all the time through spring. So it's it's we could get one last snow before it's all done. There's always one last in April sometime, always. If not, well, at least get a frost. So just know that. So the things you want to plant now are the leafy. If you're harvesting the flower, like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, if you're har harvesting the foliage, like bok choy and spinach and lettuce, these are cool season things. They need to be in the ground right away. They need to be planted while it's cold. If you wait until Mother's Day to plant the leafy things, they quickly bolt, go into flower, become off flavored, and you lose the crop because it's getting too hot for them. They need the cold nights to keep the flavor. Sweet lettuce, a bigger uh, uh, bok choys and things. These are things that need that cold nights to bring out the flavor, keep them, keep them chubby, full. Uh, otherwise, they start to elongate and they just bloom. And cauliflower is beautiful, big head. But once it starts to bloom, ugh, it's terrible. Can't use the thing. So it's all about you want to probably start those things in March. You're almost too late. So I usually will get my soil ready in February, let it set for a little bit, start planting in March. And I want to get, get all that stuff harvested before the end of May. And I'm freeing up the garden to start planting my things I'm forming. The summer crops are things you're harvesting the fruit. So tomatoes, cucumbers, eggplants, squash, pumpkins. If you're taking the fruit, not the plant, not the foliage, the fruit, those are probably summer plants. Those plants should be planted at, at Mother's Day and beyond. Okay, Don't be in a hurry. The summer plants... They don't even like cold soil. If you look at basil with a cold thought, it will wither and die before your eyes. If you need a parka on at two o'clock in the morning, it needs a parka and like a, a like a thermal blanket to keep it going. These are summer plants, okay? Uh, now, now the insider tip, I'm dealing with gardeners here. I'm ready to go, let's go. Okay. Get this class over, I wanna buy vegetables. That's the group today, okay? We know that. Um, if, if you're doing that, I cheat. Okay, I cheat. I've got a radio show. I write a garden column. And, and there's a bragging rights about gardeners. I want to tell you when I picked my first tomato, and it's two weeks before you planted yours, how good it was when I bit into it. It's just, oh, how are you doing on your tomatoes? So I want that. I want to talk about it on the radio show so I can go, oh, look, I'm a gardener. So I will plant a few things. I don't commit all the way. But I'll put a few things in the ground, a couple tomatoes, peppers. I'm a salsa gardener. I love peppers, onions, garlics. All, I like pico de gallo. There's something about a backyard party, fresh produce, and, and it's just, there's something about that. And so I want to have a few things in there. I do use a plant protector. There's a little uh, insulative. I'll protect them. So some of you retired guys, you know who you are. You buy your tomato, you put it in a, in a container with a caddy, and then you roll it out on the driveway every day. And then every night you roll it back in in the garage. You're, that's cheating. Okay, that's, that's, there's, there's medication for that. So, but you can, you can start it a little bit early if you protect them somehow. You folks that have greenhouses, that's totally cheating. That's just wrong. I don't have a greenhouse. I wish I did, but I don't. Um, so that, then you can start way early. So um, otherwise, wait. I put most of my garden in after Mother's Day. The official 100-day average, the actual date, is May 8th. 8. May 8th, 100 years of data. Over 100 years, the average is May 8th. That's the last frost. Now, here's the funny thing about averages. Half of those days, half 50 of those years, it was the end of April. The other half was the middle of May, but the average is May 8th. So that's why you always want to have some blankets, something, something ready to protect them, just in case there's a little bit of frost. That's for anything that forms a fruit. 
that, that those are the summer plants. Remember, if it's lettuce and spinach and broccoli and collard, the things you're harvesting, the flower, the foliage, don't worry about them. Let them enjoy the snow. That snow last weekend, they love that. It's okay. You don't have to cover them. I had a, uh, a friend posted on our on our Facebook page last last year. Frost came, had all of her, her plants lined up. All she did was take her, her garden hats and she just threw them over her plants for the evening to keep the frost off. Brilliant. That's brilliant. That's a great idea. If you're going to cover your plants, here's the insider tip. Whether it's a fruit tree or a summer vegetable, do not use plastic. Plastic actually holds the cold in longer and does more damage. You want a breathable material, a blanket, a sheet. We've actually got frost cover. It's usually white. It's a breathable material that will have the frost light on top of it, but not permeate through it, but then allow the warm air to, to quickly warm it up. Uh, so just kind of insider tip. I've seen too many folks do more damage than good because they used plastic. Over, over. I don't have time for questions. Hold on. That's too big. If I release you, it, it, it'll just go, it'll be a wave of questions. Um, okay. Frost dates. We got it. The last frost date is Mother's Day. The first frost of the year, you should put this one on your calendar too, is October 29. Here's the date. That's the, usually the first frost in October. So actually the locals use Halloween, if you're thinking holidays, as our first frost. Oh, I should be ready. Your tomatoes are now as big as I am. They are loaded with probably green tomatoes. Hopefully you pick some off. We'll show you how to cheat that some, get them earlier. Um, but just have be ready to protect that last because we have these classic Indian summers, what we call them. It gets cold, but then it warms right back up. And it'll go in through November. It'll be beautiful. But you'll get these flash events that could take out a tropical plant like that. And one night, it'll turn this black mush. So that's, that's what frost burn looks like. The foliage was green and now it looks like someone took a blowtorch to it and now it's wilting and turn, turned black. So just those two days. Y'all, you got it? Okay, and again, this is coming in a handout to you. So you'll have this information in, quickly this afternoon. Um, soil, it is all about the soil. You need good soil to produce good fruit. If you're gonna chuck a plant, and our I don't know if you've tried to dig a hole in the garden yet. If it's just native virgin soil, it's hard as a rock. You've never heard the word caliche till you moved here, which I think in, in indigenous people call that cement in the ground, is what they call it. That's, but it's really hard. It's a, it's a calcium layer that's kind of a chalky gray color, and water will not penetrate it. And plants don't like this stuff. So in my gardens, I've pretty much abandoned my yard. So I'm up in the Prescott Lakes, Eagle Ridge area. I'm overlooking the Dells. The vistas are beautiful. But the soil is as hard as I've ever gardened. And I'm on a north slope. So it's heavy clay soil that doesn't perk, doesn't drain. It just stays wet all the time. So I've killed more plants. Finally, I just, I just put raised beds in. I put some big retaining block on the downhill side, and I backfilled with good soil. That's what I did. And all of a sudden, the... the the gardening got so easy. I like containers. Uh, I've had two back surgeries. It is hard for me to get down on the ground anymore. This is a physical business. And so containers are just all right here. They're big ones. I just kind of garden up here. It's just easier on me. Uh, I like my raised beds to be about this, this about sitting level. That's how tall I want them to be. For me, you need at least, the book says, or the Google machine will tell you, you need at least eight inches of soil. I think you need a little bit more, especially if you're growing big crops, fruit, uh, root crops, uh, uh, carrots, potatoes. Tomatoes take a surprising amount of soil. I would say go at least 12 inches. If you go a little deeper, that's good. So that's minimum eight. When you do all the research, eight. But go a little deeper, it'll help you. Okay. And then you always want to add some freshness to the soil because plants use the soil up. So if you're using the same soil you had last year, and you're going, oh, it's not, it's not as, there's not as much vigor. The plants aren't doing as well. If the fruits are a little smaller, they don't have as many. Those are all indications my soil was used up last year. I need to re-energize, 
And that's why we add manures. We always are adding fertilizers. We're adding compost to the soil to try to refreshen that up. But if you've got raised beds or containers, you'll actually see the soil kind of shrink. It disappears. It's not that everyone goes, oh, it blew away. No, the plants actually used the soil to create the form, to, to use worms actually used it. There's a whole lot of living things happening in the soil that uses that soil. So you need to top that off. So for me right now, if you are using, I'm going to move this raspberry. I brought this just because, look, it's a raspberry. It's not related to the class at all, but it's kind of edibles. But isn't that, that's just exciting. It's like spring. It's a, it's a new blackberry. It's in blue. Blackberries do amazing. This is a heritage raspberry. Probably the top producer in the area. Top producer. Big, juicy, red raspberries. This is a thornless blackberry. So now you can, as a kid, my, my parents, I grew up in the South, so go pick some blackberries. And then I have to milk goats. And then my aunt would give us blackberries with all the goat cream. Oh, my gosh. So good. That's what you have for breakfast. But we looked like we were in a cat fight by the time we got done with the blackberries. No cat fight here. It's all just good. So anyway, this is called Superlicious. That's a good name. Big, big berries, big blackberries. Um, if you're doing soil, right now, if you're going to plant in the next, like this weekend, don't add manure. It's almost too late. You need to add manures first. Let it settle for a bit so it adjusts especially if you're using horse manure. So we're in horse country. So there's always, if you own a horse, you take it home, you put it on the paddock, you take the barn, you name it, pet them, you, you're, yeah, and then you make a sign. You go out, put it in the front yard, you have free manure. That's, that's the second thing you do if you have a horse. There's always piles of manure. If you're going to use some of that, don't use fresh manure. First of all, horses don't digest stuff. It just what it goes in comes out. So you're going to get alfalfa and straw and hay, and you're going to get all these seed stuff in there. And so you don't want to introduce that into your garden. You want to use, you want to compost it first. We get rid of the seed. And then there's this really impressive grub. It loves manure. It loves horse poop. It's a big old white worm. It looks like an alien life form that wants to suck on your jugular vein. It's ginormous. He turns into this great big beetle that has a horn on it uh, in the summer. That's the larva stage, loves horse manure. So I've had more customers take the manure, oh, free manure, oh boy, out of their gardens, all of a sudden they're fighting these huge grubs that are eating the roots on their plants. If it's composted, they're, they're gone. They like fresh manure. So just kind of watch that. Don't, don't, don't blunder that way, or else I'll make a lot of money off of you. Trying to get rid of grub, grub killers and titanaceous earths, other stuff. I'd just rather have you not have problems. Right now, if I want to plant right away, so a month ago I said add manures. Right now I'd say use premium mulch. This is a this is organic compost, screened down to quarter inch minus. Real fine, it looks like coffee ground, not coffee ground, it's a little bit bigger. It looks like a nice compost. It's gonna juice all your, your, your worms. It's gonna aerate the soil so the roots can get through it. It's gonna add, it's gonna add a lot of texture to your soil. Plants like this, okay? If you've got out there in the yard, I would add maybe a two to three inch layer of this, shovel, turn into one shovel's depth, start planting my carrots and my radishes. I just start. Okay, you can do that right away because it's not hot. Manure is very hot. It's got a lot of nitrogen. And so it can, if you put seedlings into, into manure, it, it can burn, take the seedlings, it can burn them. They start wilting, has some issues. It's a variable you don't want to adjust to. If you're not going to plant till Mother's Day, go for manure. I've got, a, I've got a deodorized barnyard manure that's not disgusting to deal with. It's actually composted, doesn't have turds in it. It actually looks like good, doesn't even smell bad. You can put it in the back of that Cadillac and it's not gonna stink up your car. So deodorant, I would do that because I've got time to let it percolate and settle. So, but if you're gonna do it this weekend, go for this. If you're doing containers or raised beds, here's the insider tip. So potting soil, soils are confusing. Uh, we have four soils down there. There's only four. When you look at that wall of depot soils, like they've got like 30 feet of 18 labels, it's stupid. 
there's really only four things. There's poop, manure, okay, manure. Uh, there's, there's mulch, this stuff, okay, compost. Um, they got all kinds of breakdown for that. There's topsoil. So topsoil is basically, the recipe is our, our mulch, we add sand. That's the recipe. It's a heavier mix, so it doesn't blow away. We need to fill in holes. I've got a big divot, plant a new tree, and I pull, I pull out a, a boulder, and I need to fill in that hole. That's topsoil. Just filler stuff. Don't really want to grow in it because it's a little bit too heavy. Uh, you could, but it's, it's made to fill in. Okay, and then you've got potting soil. The science, this will be the more expensive of, all the, of the four things because this has got peat moss and perlite. It's got those little white white specks in it, helps drainage, it's got a 555 organic. The science is in this. It's a recipe that we tweak all the time. It's like a cookie recipe. We're trying to get it just right. So a good potting soil will stay moist, but drain. That's a razor's edge in a dry climate. It's difficult to get that just right. So we've been tweaking that for here. So this is a soil made for here. This is made for containers, for buckets, for just raised beds. So the big mistake I find a lot of folks make, they're gonna, they're gonna abandon their soil in the yard. I encourage that. Makes life easier. Build a raised bed, this four by eight, whatever the size, kidney shape, you can get real creative with this. Build your bed, and now I gotta fill it with soil. Oh my gosh, and you see the bill for, I need 22 bags of this, oh my gosh. So they go down to the soil shop, you know, Prescott, dirt or whatever and they all have a garden mix and what it is they're digging out stock tanks because ranch there's a lot of ranch country they're digging out stock tanks which is silt and then they're going to add free wood chips and free horse manure blend it all together in basically a cement mixer and they go hey here's my garden mix want it doesn't grow anything it's not going to grow stuff okay you're not going to grow things in that I would use that mix as filler if I just needed to, to, to reduce the cost. I'd use it as a filler piece because it does drain because of wood chips. It does actually, water will go, which is great. The top layer, that top bed where the, where the roots are going to go into, where the, my plants, my seedlings are going to go into, I would add the top eight inches, I would do this. Because this is what our plants are grown in. This is our starts, our cuttings, our seeds are started in that. So if you look at a plant, you take this onion and you look at this soil, that's the soil, that's potting soil. It's got the white specks. If you take this plant and throw it into your native soil out in the yard, it is gonna freak out. It is not gonna like that. Plants don't like to change soils. So as much as you can keep this soil, the same as your garden soil, or make your garden soil as much as this, you're gonna have more success. So the top layer, I would take just potting soil, and I wouldn't blend it in. I would just put it on top of, or top off. If you have uh, uh, last year's gardens, you need to add some filler, just get some potting. Don't add manure, don't, don't try to blend it, don't read recipes. Just take, get a bag of this, put it at the top layer and start plugging plants. The science is in this, because it's just what this is. Can't emphasize that enough, okay? So the, I see that mistake all the time. Oh, I tried it. It didn't work last year. Ken help me. Well, what'd you do? I got my dump load of garden soil from the rock dealer. And so that's one thing I can greatly increase. If you've got containers, if they're smaller, let me put this down real quick. If they're smaller containers, let's say, I would say 12 inch or below, this size and kind of smaller, I would just take that and dump it out, use it someplace in the yard, and put fresh new potting soil in that pot and plant it that way. If it's bigger than this, 14, 18 inch, I grow a lot of things in bigger pots. Um, I would be aggressive where that plant was growing last year. I would just try to get that old root out. I'm trying to get as much, I'm trying to make pockets for fresh soil. I'd take that old root out and I would use it in the yard someplace else. So I make room for some fresh potting soil. Always add some freshness into your gardens. It'll make a change. It'll be a game changer. Okay, it's too tempting to just use up, to reuse old soil, and you wonder why your vitality, it's just not working as well as it did last year.
that will help you a lot, okay? So that's the difference. Manures, you got topsoil, you have mulch, and you have potting soil. That's pretty much everything in a bag, okay? All right, get rid of that. That's why I've had like two back surgeries. If you do thousands of bags of that in a season, oh my gosh, this is like an impale you or something. So, all right, where am I at? Let's go down. So I've got, oh, the other, the other handout was edible flowers. We wrote an article on the flowers you can actually use in salads, you know, like calendula. Uh, there's a whole bunch of hollyhocks. And then which ones not to use? You'll die if you eat, if you eat azaleas and rhododendrons. Uh, you just don't want to eat those. So there's a list of both. Okay, that's coming to you too, just for fun. It's fun taking grandkids out and eating pansies some, or dipping them in ranch dressing and just that'll impress them. The other grandkid story I had, so they, they know I'm, I'm, a, I'm a gardener and we garden together. We can teach the next generation to interact with us through a garden. And so they came in at, at the holidays. It's winter. There's nothing growing out there. Go pop pop. Let's go out and take. Let's go pick something. Uh, all right. Let's see what's out there. I had some leftover potatoes. I didn't know were still on the ground. You pull those things out. They're going. Whoa. My grandfather's a gardener. And then we I had some leftover beets. I didn't know were there. So pull up his purple looking root root crops were there. Their eyes just went. Oh my gosh. He's a garden god. That's very exciting. Okay, so tomatoes. Let's start with that because it's number one. How many people are going to grow tomatoes this year? Everyone. Yeah. It's the number one. It's the number one. We call it the introductory drug to gardening. Get them on houseplants or tomatoes, and they'll just buy everything else. That's the insider tip. That's We literally, we literally think that. Um, there's two types of tomatoes. Determinant. Indeterminate. Indeterminate is it just keeps growing. There is, it's not determined on how big it's going to get. They get huge. These are vining types of tomatoes. Okay. Determinant are, they are determined to grow one size. That's it. They're usually patio tomatoes. They're going in containers, raised bed. They're, they're, they stay smaller, yet they still form a nice, juicy, big fruit. Uh, your grandparents only grew indeterminate. They had two acres of tomatoes, and they were, actually, my grandmother let me take the salt shaker out, and I could go out in the garden and eat whatever I wanted. She was determined to get her salt shaker back, too. So peanuts, you know, southern boy, peanuts, cucumbers, okra. How many like okra? Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're my people. Okay, yeah, the, the four of you. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. So there's, there's, there's two types. So, so here's the mistake I find folks make. So our, our evenings are very cool, even in, in the summer. So it cools right back down. Plants don't grow when it's cool. Like these, are, these are tropical plants. They like it warmer. And so when it's dropping down to 50, 60 degrees, they're going, ah, I'm just going to camp out here wait. So it takes a little bit longer for the tomatoes to start forming than other parts of where it just stays more consistent days and night. So they form faster. Here, it's pretty, it's not unusual to have nice big green tomatoes and you haven't picked one and it's October already. I would suggest starting with the smaller fruits. So start with cherries, your medium-sized fruits, early girls, celebrity, champions, you'll have the list here. So medium size. Everyone wants that big slice or brandy wine. If it has beef or big in the name, probably don't start there because they do form big tomatoes, but they're notorious for, for not greeny, not getting into color at the end of the season. So if you're doing a big tomato, a beef steak, a brandy wine, these are classics. I would say start with the biggest plant you can find. Get You don't want to start by seed. You'll never get a tomato. Start with the biggest. This was started like two months ago. Go with that. At least you're two months ahead. So your smaller things, cherry, cherry tomatoes are a weed. I mean, they're like, they just form hundreds of, of fruits on a plant. 
And so they do it fast. They do it quick. They do it often. They're just this big, though. So just, they're, not, they're, not, they're not this big. So that's one thing I could say. Go with the, Think smaller to mid-sized, and you'll have more success. And you'll be able to brag your name, have them over for that garden party, pop the wine, have the bruschetta, and, and just enjoy the fresh tomatoes because you picked yours, and theirs are still green on the vine because they're growing beefsteak. Okay, that's one thing I can tell you. Um, then um, there's this whole variety. This cover heirlooms or, or traditional things you're, like early girl tomatoes. Everyone's grown early girls. That's my favorite for salsas. It's got kind of a zingy, it's got more of an acidic flavor to it, which is perfect for pico de gallo, which is magic. Uh, it's about a fruit about this big. It's red. Um, a good, good choice. Heirlooms, and we're famous for heirlooms. We've got quite a few. Heirlooms are the old-fashioned varieties, okay? The problem with heirlooms, there's no problem with it, but they're more prone to wilts. There's a, there's a wilty disease that gets written on wilt. It gets on things. They're more prone to get bugs. They're more prone to things. So you got to keep an eye on them. Probably for backyard gardens, it's okay because you're more isolated. But on a commercial setting, we never grow heirlooms usually because they're just once it gets in a crop, there's no way to there's no there's no firewall to stop it. The, the disease just keeps spreading. Um, so you'll see both here. All of our vegetables are non-GMO. We're not going to genetically modify anything, and they're all grown organically. All of them, all the herbs, everything we do because we're big into organics. And I don't want to die from chemical burn. It's, who's going to get it? The owner of the garden center is going to get it because I'm the one living it. So I'm not doing that to myself. I'm not going to subject that to you all. So, but we're small. Not everything. We have a whole certified line. It says certified organic from California. The laws are pretty, pretty, but you can't spray within 100 yards or of anything. So it just gets real weird. We cannot afford to certify everything. But just know that everything is grown organically. Okay, so, so you can go ahead and taste. And in fact, let's do this. I brought this as a fun, fun test. This is traditional Greek oregano. Oh my gosh. I just love coming up and if you've got bad breath, just nibble on this a little bit and just you're instantly Greek. Greek oregano. Just, a, just take that pastor and just rub it. It's just kind of. I use this one a lot. This is golden oregano. It smells just like that, but it's it's lightly colored. And so I use this one often in my flower beds because it just looks good. You can still use it culinary-wise. And the great thing about herbs, generally just take that and kind of smell it and pass it that way. Just something about fresh herbs. I should do that for, for here. My favorite is chocolate mint. Do I have chocolate? Chocolate mint. This is my favorite mint. So we probably have, I don't know, a dozen different types of mints. Pineapple mint and grapefruit mint and spearmint. We got the mojito mint for some of you. You know who you are, mojitos. Okay, we got that mint too. Um, I, think, I think this is, this is mojito mint. It's, it's got a bigger foliage to it. So it has that minty flavor to it. But they're fresh herbs. There's nothing... You should not have to buy a single herb from the grocery store. You can grow them all right now. You can plant these now. And you can go out and harvest whenever you want. So I was making a, a frittata for, for, for breakfast. I needed some garlic chives. Just go out there and go, ah. Because garlic is already up this tall. Onions are already growing. Parsley's already up. Uh, uh, lavender is starting to grow, but it's still got that winter look to it. Sage is starting to grow too, but you should be able to grow your own herbs, and most of them are perennial. <coughs> they come, come back year after year. Boy, it must be that herb thing got me. You folks online, we are glad you're tuned in. If you could, Google loves it when you like, subscribe, and make a comment. Just download, help us out because it helps us rank against the big boys. Glad you're tuned in. Um, anyway, herbs. So the, the basic ones are Italian herbs, oregano, thyme, parsley. Uh, but you can also grow fennel. Uh, some of them we've got in, like, like uh, French tarragon. 
kind of an unusual one, lemongrass, kind of an unusual one. When you see those, grab them right away. You don't want to wait and think about it. Just grab them because the crops are real limited. Basil, there's tons of basil coming. With that being said, um, you can plant the herbs we have right now. We don't have the summer herbs. We're trying to hold you back from basil. I know we're losing sales, but I know if you go plant that, you're going to fail because it doesn't like cold. So we're trying to we're trying to throttle some of your garden habits a little bit. It's coming. We're trying to get at least at the end of this month. But really, I would not plant basil myself till May. Really, until the soil gets warm enough. Then it just doubles in size every week. You can't pick it fast enough. So herbs you can grow really well here. And they're almost all of them perennial. A couple of them aren't. Fennel's not. Um, cilantro is not. Basil. Those are the three I can think of right now that are annuals. They grow for the season, they die, and they don't come back. Some of them act like perennials in that they reseed. So cilantro, once you have it, you can't get rid of it because the seed just, just reseeds so easily. Um, but truly, it's a perennial comes back from the same root. The same plant comes back from that. That's a true perennial. Okay? Right, there you go. Herbs like full sun, at least six hours. Uh, the more sun, the better. And pick, 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 pick. You cannot pick it enough. The more you pick the foliage, the more it produces. So it's brutal. You just have to go all marine on, on herbs. You just pick them. Sometimes I pick them just because I don't want them to go into flower. I don't need any more. I just pick it and add it to compost or picking. I don't know what to do with all this stuff. But I just pick it so that it keeps producing foliage. Your herbs will be the same way. My best herb gardens, just, 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 my name's Ken. We're just gardeners. This is kind of, this, this works for me. I think it can help you too. My best gardens are on the east side. So the east side of my, again, we got a two-story house where we're looking at the Dells. You got to go from the driveway down the, down the sidewalk to the backyard. Classic hillside. I wish I had a ranch house like some of you, one level, but that's not us. We're still living in our original family house. So way too many bedrooms, too many bathrooms, but it's what we know and we love it. So, but you're going down the stairs and every stair has got a garden next to every step. And it's got a separate herb all the way down the east side of the house. It's beautiful. It smells good. You come to the back gate. It says, welcome. We've got big pots over here. This says, we're glad you're welcome to the party in the backyard. Come on in. Pick some herb if you want. Uh, we grow rosemary, uh, good rosemary here. This is, there's two kinds of rosemary that grow here. There's the big one. So this gets up easily hip high. Uh, this one is fantastic. If you're into grilling, barbecues, uh, pick one of these long stems off, strip off the foliage, use it as a skewer for like chicken and pork. It's magic. All your friends will think, you are a grill master. Oh my gosh, and a gardener, because you use these big long stems. This is an upright variety. They also make a creeping or ground cover type of, of rosemary. And it looks like, where is that at? You can kind of tell, it's just starting to grow sideways, okay? Here's the, here's the thing for you Phoenix folks. Rosemary is a very large family of plants. Not all rosemary is hardy for up here. So you want to get one that's a zone six. You want one that can go down to at least single digits or it will die out in the winter. So many folks from the valley, they start bringing from, not Prescott Valley, from flat, the Flatlanders from Phoenix, okay? Those valley people, why would they live 10 miles from the sun? I don't understand. <laughs> so sticking hot down there. Come up to God's country. It's beautiful up here. But the, the, the ground cover, especially the trailing, there's only like two varieties that grow up here. Um, there's, there's maybe three or four varieties of upright rosemary that grows up here. Of course, you're, you're going to find all of those at Waters Garden Center. There you go. We don't sell the annual varieties. We just we want you to be successful. So just put that on your radar. Get the right variety. Do your homework. Okay. 
this is an evergreen weed. You can't kill this. It's a pollinator. Right now, mine are in bloom. The bees are out foraging. They're really hungry. They've been hibernating all winter. They're coming out going, there's nothing in bloom yet. They find the blue flowers of your rosemary. Um, the other one too, rosemary. I like planting this kind of close to my vegetable gardens because sometimes there's a pollination issue with, uh, yeah, when you get done with it, just put it on the ground. I'll pick it up later. There's those herbal things going out. Um, I like blue flowers and yellow flowers. Actually, I'll plant some blues and yellows in my vegetable garden because blues and yellows are irresistible to bees. They just, there's something about it. It's like, oh, flowers, I'm going to go this way. If you need to attract pollinators into your gardens to squash, it starts to form and then turns yellow and falls off, that's a pollination issue. Tomatoes, they just sit there and won't, they won't set fruit. It's a pollination issue. So attract more bees. And flowers are a natural for that. And, and rosemary is kind of a top, top one for that blue flower that it puts on. So you can attract more bees. Um, let, me, let me reset here and go, where, where am I at? Tomatoes, let's focus on tomatoes. Determinate, indeterminate. You can plant them now as long as you're protecting them. Nice, rich soil. You put a tomato in the water's potting soil, magical. You're going to have huge tomatoes. They're going to grow fast. Um, what I find with my vegetable gardens, when I first plant them in spring, they start to grow like crazy. I mean, for about six weeks, they're just on fire. Wow, I'm a gardener. Look, everything's growing so fast. And then they hit kind of the end of May. I'm starting to water a little bit more because it's starting to get warm. June's coming. It's a hot, dry, prevailing wind. And my plants stop growing. This is just me, okay? I have a feeling it might pertain to you too. But when your plants are growing like crazy and then they just kind of slow down, you're going, what is going on? What's happened is you're starting to water a little bit more and the nutrients you put into the soil to start them off with, that juiced them, they got growing, and then they used it up. You'll need to reapply some fertilizer a little more often than you would other places here because our soil, we just don't have good soil. And so you're, you're, you're fertilizing a little bit more often. Here's what I use. Oh, man. Fruit, and, fruit and vegetable food. Does that come up on camera okay? Yep. Yeah? All right. Fruit and vegetable food. This is a completely organic food. It's lots of meals and that kind of stuff. Six, four, four, seven. It's got four numbers. There's a reason for that. So you're going to have a calcium deficiency in your gardens. It's something that has to do with our alkaline water. So our water causes this. And so what the indication is where that tomato formed or cucumber or pep, bell peppers, where the flower touches the fruit, you'll start to get this black rotting spot. It's called blossom end rot. It, we're notorious for it. That's almost always a calcium deficiency. So it's something you're going to struggle with. If you have that, simply use... 6447, this has got 7% calcium in it because we know you're going to struggle. It's pelletized, so it's easier to spread get in, into the soil. So it's made to either sprinkle on top of the soil or add to it. When I first start my gardens, I actually put a layer on, I turn it down, I actually turn it under, get the soil into the ground, get the fertilizer into the ground. Um, my plants will just take off. Then when they stop growing as quickly towards the end of May, first part of June, I'll sprinkle some more of this on. And then as water hits it, it just releases a little bit more of the organic food. Just note calcium. The lesson is calcium. Fertilize more often. Okay, the great thing about organic is they break down slowly. So this will break down over about a two-month period. I'm fertilizing about every six, eight weeks with this. Just add a little bit more. I'm pretty generous. And it's hard to burn with, with organic fertilizers. For the love of gardening, please stop using that miracle grow. It is not your friend, okay? It's a salt-based fertilizer that reacts with our water and causes more damage than good. There's a reason we don't sell the number one ag product in the country here at Waters Garden Center. We don't sell miracle grow. I got tired of talking to my customers, and every time it was they were damaging their plants with miracle grow. I'm going, we're the place where our plant, where products work, our plants grow. It doesn't fit our, our values. So we stop selling it. It's painful. You just stack it high, watch it fly. Easy money. Miracle Grow is easy money. But I don't want my friends using it. 
So I, we don't sell it. What we do do, do do. <laughs> Sorry, my man. <laughs> you guys that are sick. Uh, we made our own. This is uh, flower power for containers and raised beds. If you're a miracle grow, you like adding your fertilizer to your watering can, this is the stuff you want to use. This will grow tomatoes that are huge. It's 48% phosphorus. Remember, nitrogen, phosphorus, potash. Nitrogen forms green growth. I want foliage. I want fast. I need green beans to grow fast. Nitrogen. Corn. All nitrogen. Corn is just basically big grass. Cool. Nitrogen. If you want fruits, fruits are phosphorus. That middle number causes fruits. You want bigger tomatoes, bigger squash, pumpkins. You're going to enter in the fair and win. Middle number, phosphorus. Potash is the last number. That's uh, stem sturdiness, leaf thickness, disease hardiness. How can I stand up in the wind? That's the last number. That's what the three numbers do. This is 48% phosphorus. It's as high as we could go without it starting to solidify and settling to the bottom. It's still liquid form. And it's available to the plant like, like now. So instantaneous. So kind of an insider secret, if we ever invite you over to our house, we'll have like the staff over. It's a backyard party. It's a great season. You guys are great. Well, I know they're going to come judge me on my gardens. They're, gard they're horticulturalists. Gardeners do this. And so two weeks before, if you're having a wedding or you're having your brother come over, he hasn't, you haven't seen him in two years, just two weeks before you have the backyard party, just deadhead everything, hit them with this, and they will be in full bloom two weeks later. It's like magic. It's like, every time, it's, a, it's like a home run. So it's kind of how I, how I use it. Also, if you want to have bigger tomatoes, bigger squash, I'll hit this about every, I don't know, two, three weeks, pick up my watering cans because I feel good about myself. And I water my plants. They're all happy. This is the, this is the steak and potatoes. This is, the, this is the core. This is a Snickers bar. If you're thinking in terms of foods for us, how, how plants would relate to that. This is a quick snack. This is like the, the meat and potato stuff, okay? That's food. You'll fertilize more often than you think here because we don't have that. You poor Wisconsin people, Minnesota, you don't have eight foot of soil here. You have millimeters. And then your contractor took it and scraped it all off and built your footers in your house. You have, some of you have no soil. You have dead soil. You're gonna have to rebuild this up and reintroduce organics back into the, into the, so it means you're gonna fertilize a little more often, okay? When I'm planting my tomato or peppers or whatever, this is the perfect tomato plant. I love this tomato. Let me show you why. I really don't wanna brutalize this, but I will for you all. I wonder if I'll plant one. Sun gold's such a good one. So what I would do with this, let me take my pruners. So with this, I want a tall vine uh, with low branches. And what I'm looking to do, I'm going to take this, it's this going to hurt. Hold on. It's okay. Plant won't mind. I would take this, trim these off to expose more of this vine. And I would plant this thing this deep and I would plant it even deeper. All the hairs that are on this vine those will turn into roots if you expose it to soil. That's why you want more than just eight inches of soil for tomatoes. You want at least, what is that, a foot. Get the deeper, the better. In a dry climber, climate, the deeper, the better. That means during the June, into June, it's 95 and it's hot. Plants get a little weepy. They're big crybabies. They get hot, they get cold, they weep, they talk about it. They're so dramatic. The sun goes down, they go, oh, no, just kidding. I'm fine. Dunk, they perk right back up. Um, I would plant that as deep as I could. That's why I'm looking for a long stem so I could bury it deeper. So big bushy ones, not as appealing for me. Uh, unless it's something like a patio tomato, tomato like this. This is made to stay right in this. Remember, determinant, indeterminate, determinant. This only gets this, it only gets so big. This is a just a chubby, doesn't get a big vine. It just stays bushy. It has been determined to stay a small size, yet it still forms fruits that are big enough to, to eat on. Okay, so patio tomato, decks. I only have an apartment. I want something small. Uh, this is the one for you. 
I've got a big yard. I've got big raised beds. This is going to get as big as I am. By the end of the season, easily, chunk, big, full. Make sure you got a big tomato cage and a stake to keep it upright because that's going to be big. This one probably would stay by itself. Determinant, indeterminate, okay? Uh, watering. I'd probably water this. Main thing is make sure the plants are not wet going into the evening. Wet plants, like in July and August, you're doomed. You're going to have mildew and spots and white fly and all kinds of crazy stuff. I like to water early, early, early morning before the heat of the day. I want my plants to be fully hydrated before they go into the heat of the day. I want them being dry as they go into the evening. Because otherwise, you just have all the warmth and, and moisture. Um, just creates all kinds of leaf spots and things. So that's a, that's a curse that Phoenix has. They go, oh, you want to you water in the evening? Rain harvest. You want to make sure everything's wet? Well, yeah, when it's 100 degrees at midnight, you can do that. But we're going to cool down to 60. It's going to be, we sleep with the windows open. It's going to be beautiful. That's going to cause issue, leaf spots and stuff. Fruit and it'll wilt, all kinds of stuff. So just the lesson is, I try to keep everything watered before 8 o'clock in the morning, 9 at the latest. Uh, and then it starts by 10, 11, it's starting to get warm. And they're, they're able to take that easier. And then I try not to water. If they're real weepy at the end of the day and it's like 5 or 6 o'clock, well, right, suck it up, boys. The sun's going down and they just perk right back up. I try not to water them going into that evening or I at least don't get the foliage wet. Okay, so those are things that can help you. The myth that's totally a myth, not even true. If you water in the middle of the day and water hits, hits the foliage, it does not create a magnifying thing that burns your, it's not going to laser beam your foliage. I've not seen that ever, and I've tried. That's just internet hoo-ha. I don't know what that is. So anyway, um, peppers grow amazing. I would say at least, give them at least six hours of sun or more with fruit, fruiting plants, more foliage. I mean, tomatoes are just sugar-making factories. They're just more foliage exposed to the sun, the more tomatoes you get. They just crank. So the more sun you can give them, I'd say minimum six hours. Otherwise, you're not going to, it's just going to lean, stretch. Your, your fruit's going to be small, not very many. Uh, with that being said, maybe the exception would be if you're going to plant your leafy things towards summer, I do find some shade helps them get through summer better. So lettuce, spinach, broccoli, cauliflower, these things that don't like the heat, if you can get, get them some sun, some out of the sun a little bit, that does help extend the season some. Also rhubarb. I don't know how many rhubarb people we have. I've grown a lot of rhubarb. I like rhubarb. I find it's best to plant that. I've got a got a big juniper and I used to have rhubarb right out there and this and the hail rips the daylights out so the hail of summer just shreds those big pads big leaves so if I can get them just I've got them on the south side just underneath the juniper game changer now because you're going to get hail you're going to get it it's going to come monsoons August September you're going to get a hail is going to happen and some of those plants get damaged that took that took all the edge off so I got these big, beautiful pads. And these are things that are perennials. They, they stay, they come back every year. So uh, uh, artichokes, strawberries, uh, a lot of these things are perennials. So plant them where they're going to stay. Herbs, plant them where they're going to stay because you're not going to till this stuff up every year. Vegetables like tomatoes, cucumbers, these things, that's every year you're going you're gonna to replant that kind of stuff. Okay. What else? Now we're down to almost questions. I brought this for you. Isn't that exciting? I knew we were dealing with garden. Strawberries. Strawberries are weed. This truly is a weed. Planted, planted out there where it just creeps and crawls. I've got a pond in the backyard where the overflow. So I rain harvest off the gutters. It dumps down through the yard. I try to hydrate the soil. And it backfills and tops off the, the pond. And then from there it even gets more. And it, I've got a lower pond that kind of just kind of retaining things. So my neighbors aren't mad at me because all my water is going downhill and flooding them out. I plant these in that lower pond because they'll take that wet 
And then they creep and they crawl and they just kind of spill out. And they do do this pretty easily. I don't have to put straw over them in the winter. I'm kind of a lazy gardener. I don't like doing a lot of work, but I like the beauty. And I like to pick strawberries. They just do it themselves pretty easy because we're so mild here that we just don't have this extreme temp winters that you got to insulate them. They just do it themselves. So strawberries do exceptionally well right here. What else I got? We've got watermelon radishes. If you like radishes, these are humongous, red, beautiful radishes. Uh, bok choy. I don't know if you're into Asian cooking or just great sautés stuff. Is that beautiful or what? Oh, my gosh. Antioxidant like crazy. Anything with a purpley kind of color, super healthy, and you're never going to find this at Trader Joe's. You're going to have to grow it yourself. You're going to have to grow it yourself. Okay, same thing with kale. Kale is a weed. It grows year round. Nothing's healthier than juicing kales. Kale, 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 kale. I love kale. So it comes green typically, which is super healthy, but also purple. You got two colors. And you can start this now. Um, this one will tend to bolt on me a little bit in the summer, but then it, it just keep it topped off. The fall comes and it just starts getting bushy and full. And I'm harvesting kale year round. It's one of those plants that will just go, even in winter, it still produces. Okay. Uh, I mentioned this is a uh, um, Brussels sprouts. This is a very tall plant. And the Brussels sprouts form up and down the stems. So you're harvesting these little tiny broccoli looking things, cauliflower, anyway, cabbage looking things. Uh, but this does really well. Probably a place where you could stake it because the wind starts to get them. I find I have to stake my Brussels sprouts just because they're such a tall plant. Okay. Bless you. Uh, broccoli. This is one you want to get in this weekend. Get it sooner is better before the before June. Want as many weeks before June as you can because June comes. There's no hole. If it hasn't formed the biggest size, big enough rack for you, it's just going to bolt to go into flower, which you can use, but it's just not as it's not as good. So sooner is better. Cool season. Okay, da, da, da. oh, quick loss. I brought this for now's when you plant peas, peas like cold. Beans do not. Beans like summer. So usually I will grow my peas first. When this thing is bolted, I've taken my, whether it's sugar pods or whatever kind of pea you like, um, I'll take those out, put a little bit more freshness into my soil, plant my beans. That's usually the end of May, June, and then it just takes off and I get my bean crop. So it's called square foot gardening or high density gardening. You can have multiple crops out of the same space. But the big mistake I see is folks plant these too late and they think it's a summer plant. They're wondering why it didn't do as well. And they plant beans way too early. And again, you'll have the calendar in your inbox by the end of the day. It'll tell you carrots, plant, plant, what day? It'll give you a date range. And it's not something regurgitated from Google. It's actually our calendar for here. Yeah, but I'm from Prescott Valley. You Prescott Valley folks are so cute. I'm special because I live in the valley. You're the same as the rest of us. You're, you're maybe two days ahead of us. It's We're, we're all the same. Paulden, Chino Valley, we're all the same. The date applies to all of us the same. Same frost date. I think their last frost date is May 6th in Prescott Valley. We're May 8th. You're not as special as you think you are. You're the same as the rest of us, okay? So just the lesson is bees and peens, just know the difference. I brought this just because it's pretty. You've never seen a pink lavender, only available at Waters Garden Center. Really, truly, this is a funky new, lavender's always blue. This is Spanish lavender. You have three kinds of lavenders, English, French, and Spanish. There's three main types. English is the main landscape one. It's kind of within wispy, kind of light butterfly-y kind of flower to it, big. Spanish always, this is the one that gets in the front of magazines. They always take a picture of this because look at it. It's beautiful. And then uh, French lavender, kind of wimpy, but it's the one you make all the oils from. So you potpourris, that's from French. So we got all three here. Um, 
This grows fantastic in a container. This needs drainage. And so if you put this in clay soil, it's just going to die on you. And if you like to water, if your hobby is not gardening, but it's watering, you know who you are. Coffee cup, and you're, every morning you with your hose out there. Lavender's not for you. It doesn't like to be watered that much. It wants to have a wants to take a breath. So it's kind of a it's kind of a drought hardy sensitive thing. Also, most oh, about this most animals leave herbs alone. They don't like the smell. They don't like the oils. Uh, they seem so javelina. Deer. With that being said, I've had some deer pressure in the past from cilantro, a little bit, and basil. Sometimes I'll eat those. But the other ones, er, thyme, um, the other, uh, rosemary's, lab, they don't eat those. Oregano's, mint, they don't like mint. I love mint. They don't like it. So if you're, if you're in that wildland interface where you have a lot of, a lot of animals, herbs, I'll actually use herbs to uh, that golden oregano that got passed around. I use that as a as a pretty plant to mask some of the, uh, the scent of some of my other flowers I don't want them to eat. Bay laurel. Bay leaves, my mother, man, everything, every dish had bay leaves in it. <laughs> Mom, what, what is this? It does taste good. Uh, but bay does actually work well. I find this probably performs better for the valley. This is where this valley is probably specialer than us. But Prescott seems to be an annual where it struggles. If you get a harsh winter, it seems to kill it out. If you're at that 5,000 foot level and lower, it's like a it's it's a perennial bush, evergreen. So there's there's a line where it seems to keep going. With mine, I've had, mine's three years old, but it's on the east facing wall. So I put it up against the house. So the house actually, I think, I think insulates it some. So it's it's got it's not as when I grew it in Skull Valley, it was a big old bush. That's 4,200 foot. Up here at 5,700 foot, I've got it protected. I've got to be a little creative. I created my own little micro zone, micro climate, and it seems to be doing well. So basil is kind of that borderline. It's a zone eight plant. So zone eight. We are zone seven, in case you're wondering. Zone seven. We need plants to go down to 15 degrees. Zone six is five, 10 degrees. So you want plants that can go down to at least mid-teens because we get, we get mid-teens every, every winter. So, okay. With that being said, I can go with questions. Let me give one. I could keep going on and on. Let me give you one insider. I'll give you two. Two things, and then, I'll, then we'll take questions, okay? So we are notorious for tomatoes specifically forming, and then they, they have a crack where they got a real tough skin. I hear this pretty often from, from new folks. I f what that is, uh, when you're, it's that swelling. It's, it goes from, I'm plump and full, it's in the morning, it's cool, and then it's hot and dry, and this fruit ebbs and flows. It actually loses some size, and as it does that, the skin cracks or becomes thick and tough. It's trying to protect itself. If you can regulate that temperature, the moisture in the soil and keep it more consistent, the fruit won't do this as much and you'll have more tender, juicier, less cracked fruit. Tomatoes are specifically a problem child. For me, I like perfect tomatoes and I like big ones. Um, at the bottom of my tomato, before I plant it, let's see, I'm taking this one. So I'll dig my hole. I want it to be this deep. I'm digging it this deep, put it in the ground. I will sprinkle a touch of Aqua Boost crystals. This is polymers. So it holds like 200 times its weight in water. So these crystals absorb this moisture and then it releases it back to the plant as it needs it during the heat of the day. So it regulates my, my moisture around my, my plants. Game changer for tomatoes. Um, it also, we've infused these uh, with mycorrhizal colonies. So mycorrhizals are the beneficial bacteria bacteria things that attach themselves to roots and they extend roots out. So they take the plant, and they, they, they give it more robust roots. More roots plus consistent moisture get you better tomatoes. I put it underneath all my veggies. So a little bottle will go a long ways, maybe a tablespoon. I just, I just dig my hole, plant a little bit, kick a little bit of soil over it, plant my plant, boom. Um, they seem to last for about a year. 
and then they just, I don't know where they go, they just disappear. I think the worms eat, eat the polymers, what they do. But anyway, that's some, that's a little, little insider tip I think would, would really help you. Secondly, I am forever fighting loss of mineral. I don't care how much calcium, you got bone meals, you got gypsums, you, you're trying to introduce calcium. Once a week, I'm out there in the morning. I love my coffee and just going out and talking to my plants, it's therapy for me. Then I come in and I deal with the public for the rest of the day. It's my decompression time in the morning. I like butterflies. I'll go out once a week. I'm spraying one of these two things on my vegetable gardens. I generally, once the plants are up to size, so this is starting to, to flower. Once I start to see flowers, I will start to hit that plant with tomato and pepper set. It can also be known as blossom set. Now, this is not pollen in a bottle. What this does is literally that plant will start growing, and tomatoes are notorious for, for just growing. They put all their energy into growing. Their program, grow, grow, grow. Um, <coughs> they literally forget to slow down and set fruit. What, 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 what the tomato and pepper set does it causes that plant to, to slow down for a moment and remember what it's supposed to do, set a flower so you can set a fruit. So this, it's, we are just notorious for plants that are big, green, and no fruit yet. This will set fruit. And it works on more than just tomatoes. I put it on my cucumbers. I just go and I miss, don't focus on the flower, focus on the foliage. That's another myth. And so you want big bottles of this because you're spraying the foliage and just once a week I go don't 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 can I spray it so in between weeks so once a week I start with this once the plants are up to size and then I switch the next week to yield booster so I get a bottle of these at the start of every season and I got as soon as they're up to size blossom set this is liquid calcium in a bottle what calcium does for plants do you want bigger fruits or sweeter fruit, flavorful, calcium is what brings out the flavor and the size. You can put liquid calcium, it absorbs this through the foliage, focus on the foliage, don't, don't spray the fruit, doesn't matter if you spray the fruit, but focus the foliage. I just go out and I just spritz and I sip my coffee and it makes me feel better. In the morning, I just do that. If you do once a week, just switch it off to the growing season, you'll have magical fruits. So game changer. It's real. Those are two insider tips I can tell you, personal experience. It really works. These two things and the Aqua Boost. Okay. With that, I could keep going on and on and on because that's what gardeners do. I like fun gloves, big hats. I'm a gardener. So like the rest of you. Questions? What do we got? Yes. Tomatoes and strawberries. How often should you water and how much? Yeah. yeah. Watering. Right now I'm watering every three days in my containers. I was watering every four, but we finally got a little bit of warmth. So I'm watering a little bit more often. This is herbs. Anything shallow rooted. It's my pansies, kale, um, all my herb gardens. Lettuce, all these smaller things. I was watering your forty. I just bumped it up to every three days. When you get into June, and it's a raised bed, especially or a container, I might be watering every day. Probably I'm watering every day, uh, especially if you got a great big tomato plant. I will try to go as tomatoes are actually a good canary in the coal mine. They'll actually tell you how often to water as you get into summer because they're so talkative. They get dry, they just start wilting. Oh my, they're just crying out, water me. You know, okay, if it's been two days, uh, maybe I should bump that every day in the morning. So they'll kind of talk to you somewhat. A lettuce can do that to you. Pansies will do that. They'll lay down, they're just big crybabies. The reason they call them pansies, because they're pansies. They just talk to you. If they're cold, they lay down. If they're dry, they lay down. They can tell you how often. No one can truly tell you how to water your gardens. This is where, because my back garden is different than my front garden. Your soils will change. Each of our gardens are just a little different. But in general, about right now, every two to three days would be my guess, because they're fairly new. You're just putting them in. 
the roots haven't really filled out yet. You could probably keep that process going until we get that first, once you're in the high 90s, it's hot. In the 90s, it's just hot. And in the spring, there's this prevailing southwest wind that just happens until the monsoons come. So through June, it's just 10% humidity, sucks the life out of plants. So you might have to water a little bit more off or keep an eye on it. And then the monsoons come and every, the whole gardens go berserk because the humidity goes up. So that's about how you'll water, okay? How much? Until the entire root zone is moist. Or if it's in a container, until you see water coming out from the bottom. In the back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what she had for you folks online, she, had to, she planted her first garden last year. She had lots of them. Sounds like they were really crammed in together. Too many in the first space. And uh, they all cross pollinated All she ended up with was cherry tomatoes. I'll bet you had so many. How do you can that many cherries? How do you pick that many cherries? Um, so how often to space? Really, you just space them so they're not. Generally, about every six feet, you'll space a tomato. Because these are big. If it's indeterminate, they're not. There's no defined or determined size, indeterminate. They're going to get big as I am and this big around. I like cages. The bigger the cage, the better. Um, and cages are ugly. I mean, they, sometimes they should create a, I spray paint mine red and blue and I have fun. I create them into, I turn them into art. Um, so you can have fun with them. But cage holds them upright. I also cage my peppers. Just because the wind keeps them upright. When you get big peppers on your pepper plant, it's not that big, but it just holds it upright in a windstorm. Just keeps them, and they're pretty. So I turn them into beauty. Um, so I would say space them out a little bit more, grow them upright instead of growing them out like this, and you'll have much more success. And then probably don't plant as many cherry tomatoes. Just have one is enough. Get your get some romas, get some other, get some, get some indigos, get some plant else in there. Yeah. Yeah, so his question is, can he add vinegar to, the, to his water to help his more acidic-loving types of plants, like blueberries? Actually, everything is going to like more acidity. Your water is the enemy. Your water is extremely high in pH. Some of you that are on a well, I've literally seen 9.4 pH. I mean, that's basically you clean the kitchen counters with that stuff. It's like ammonia. It's that bad. Nothing grows in that. So if you start to water with that, uh, the plants will turn yellow. Uh, the, the flowers will start dropping off without pollinating. The fruits will start forming, then turn yellow and just wilt off. Those are all indications my pH went up. Will vinegar lower the pH? Yes, it will for a flash, and then it's gone. You're probably better off if you've got that. Uh, we make a fertilizer down there. I didn't bring it up here, but it's called um, all-purpose plant food. The main ingredient in that is cottonseed meal, very acidic. Uh, and we actually add sulfur, which lowers pH. Sulfur is going to be your friend. Sulfur is, actually lowers pH and keeps it consistently at a lower. That's what you're going to need. Question over here? Something out back there. You okay? Yeah? Um, so we do have a greenhouse. Awesome. I'm jealous. You got a greenhouse. My goodness. Do you have a tomato that we can purchase today? Yeah, like. Why, yes, thank you for asking. We do have tomatoes and peppers you can purchase today. Yes. So the peak of the season is going to be, here's how it rolls. So we've got a crop rotation. We've got a calendar where we're growing certain varieties, and we know what week they're going to come on. Because we've got to invest. You, you're buying a tray of 144. That's how many plugs. There's a science to it. You've got to have so many per week. And so the grow calendar peaks Mother's Day weekend, because that's when everyone's, all the novices go, I can't plant until Mother's Day. Well, yeah, you can. You just got to know what to plant, what date. You all will have the calendar so you know what to plant. Um, so, But a greenhouse, you can cheat that easily up to six weeks. You can start your seed. All uh, For me, I tried growing in greenhouses and I gave up because it wasn't affordable to heat. So in January, the days are so short, I just didn't want to spend that much. It's cheaper to buy a new tomato plant. And to keep this one going. 
And so I've kind of, I just, I use it as an extender. You can easily get a month and a half to two months before it starts, anyone else starts, and after. So you're gardening to the end of the year, but that mid-December through January, it's rough. It's just days are so short, it, it, the cost, no matter what you do, all kinds of insider tips on how to keep a greenhouse warm, none of them work. They're just expensive. You gotta put a heat source in and keep it going. So but yeah, tomatoes and peppers right over here. Thank you very much. So in the back, yeah. Oh, snails are bad. Yeah. Yeah. What you need is a good escargot recipe. That's what you need. Yeah. Yeah, so snail, there is a snail bait down here. Something you're going to fight. Uh, don't let them win. Go all marine on them. I, I want to see nothing but shells, dead, empty shells. And their children and their children I want generations of shells sitting on the ground. I want to walk across the ground until I hear crunching. That's what I want. Snail bait. That's going to be your friend. And we have an organic one. So you can put it in the garden and keep it completely organic. You got to be careful because there are a lot, most snail baits are very poisonous. Um, and the plants can't absorb some of that. But, but iron base, iron sulfate, phosphates are, are the way to go. They'll pelletize things. They'll come out crawl across it and die. That's what you're gonna to need to do. Yeah, there, there's that myth, but you know, there's something about never use good beer or wine. <laughs> Don't ever give it to them. Yeah, snail bait, crack the bottle, and enjoy the beer while you're watching them die. That's a better way to do that. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, that's right. So tomato worms, we should cover that. That big old tomato worm. There's a big green, in fact, you'll see a humming, it's called a hummingbird moth. It's a great big moth that looks like a hummingbird. Um, has a great big long proboscis and there's a good pollinator, and actually good. The problem is she loves tomatoes and she lays her eggs on tomatoes and her larva or her kids look like giant green tomatoes. That is the same, that's the same thing so that caterpillar turns into a sphinx moth or hummingbird moth okay they're going to show up usually june july sometime in there um and you'll just see foliage disappear and you might see little turd droppings all over the lower you'll see little tiny pellets keep it classy here we're at waters uh down but that they, they can strip a they can strip a plant like crazy if you see that the uh caterpillar killer will we'll do that. If we see it's real bad, I'll try to make an announcement in our newsletter or I'll mention on the radio show, I'll go, hey, we're getting all this wave of customers coming in with caterpillars. You should go out and check your, your gardens. And if you need that, here's, here's a stuff. We'll try to feature it. I try not to cry wolf too much or people freak out. I try to just, if I see there's a wave going through the community and usually aphids hit us all at the same time, blister beetles. The clouds turn black and they, they strip trees and butterfly bush. I'll wait until I see that show up. And it's always Chino Valley seems to be the leader. And then it kind of floats through and then it comes finally hits hits different communities different times. I'll try to wait till we all can kill them. So yeah, we get it covered. Tomato killer or, or caterpillar killer in the back. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. Yeah, my main friend, if you're in doubt, but you just don't know which one of these to use to plant in, go with this. It's a little bit more money, but a whole lot better product because the science is in this. There's, a, there's fertilizers and the recipes here. You started with manure. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, you're good to go. So you actually came to the soil class. Do that and start plugging. You're ready to plant. That's good. Oh, she saw it online. It's music in my ears. So that's good. What else? You're very needy. Okay. Yeah. 
So I don't know. She said, her question was, how long should I run my drip system? There's so many variables, I don't know. For me, really you want to think through, I want that drip to run, and I want it to go through the root zone and a little bit farther until you figure out how long that takes to do that with your emitter head. Because you can be using half inch, half gallon, one gallon, two gallon, four gallon per hour. There's spray heads. There's so many variables. No one can tell you truly. But you can certainly test it. This is where a good tool for gardeners, a moisture meter is your friend. $10 tool. It'll tell you when it's moist. You can roll it up and then you can see where the moisture is. It's a good tool to help to communicate. And you can use it on house plants, other stuff. But maybe it's time for a moisture meter to help you educate. It. And once you know, you don't need the moisture meter anymore because you just know, oh, I run it for 15 minutes. It seems to be deep enough. My guess is you're probably more than that. You're probably more like 30, 40 minutes before it's deep enough to, to penetrate the entire root bulb. If you're doing containers, water until you see water. Irrigate until you see water come out the holes in the bottom. I personally, for my containers, I have over 50 containers. Again, I've had back surgeries. I don't want to bend over. I can't get down there. I don't want to kneel. It's hard for me. And so I put saucers underneath my pots, and I have water until that saucer is filled up. And I've just created my own self-watering container. So if I take some potting soil from the top where the plant is, all the way to the bottom, and then touch it where the saucer is, that plant, as it, as it gets hot, it will actually wick that water back from and back up into the root ball. So the soil is the carrier for the moisture. The plant will actually attract that moisture back into the pot. So you can create your own self-water, but see, the point being, water until you see water coming out the bottom. Okay, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Good. Whoever speaks first. And then we'll just go, we're only going to do two, two more because we're, we're 25 minutes over. So you all can keep going. I'll just hang though. Okay. Lavender does not like growing in the shade. No. I would say at least six hours of sun and then it would do well. You'd be better off. Rosemary does a little better. I can get a little bit flat and stuff. Uh, uh, a thyme is a weed, wherever. So it's probably some bit, parsley is a great one. Kale will love that. So, but not not lavender, yeah. Yep. Okay, so you're going real deep. So crop rotation. That's pretty deep. This is this is vegetable gardening 501. Okay. So there are some diseases that can come back that are soil borne that come back from Last year's crop can carry over. That's why, we, that's why we move plants around. So we give the soil a break so these bacteria don't get a chance to get a, to colonize and kill my soil. Uh, tomatoes are notorious for having disease. And once it gets in the soil, there's no recovery. So it's good to rotate your tomatoes. Don't plant them in the same spot every time. For you, what you said was, can I use the same pot? Yes. Can I use the same soil in the same pot? No, you should put fresh soil in that and you'd be fine. You can use all potting soil. Yeah, just go straight into this, add fresh, wait, where you go. So for me, I'll grow my tomatoes in my pots one year and then I'll switch and put them in the raised beds the next year. I'm always doing this. I kind of switch peppers and tomatoes off. Do not plant potatoes and tomatoes in the same area because they're the same crop. They're the same genus. So you don't want to plant those in the same. That's not a rotation. That's more of the same. So plant them in different areas. I do actually, I get a big grower's pot for my potatoes. Big black bucket, ugly as can be. It's hideous, but so convenient. So I put some potting soil in, put my seed potatoes in. I, as it grows, I just backfill uh, this pot as my Tomato, my potato vines grow. And at the end of the year, you just take the bucket and dump it out and all the potatoes are there. So easy. My mouth just watered thinking about that. Now, with that, we can keep going. I know gardeners are here. Appreciate it. Sorry the seats got so hot. I'll hang out as long as you want. Just stay here. 
uh, make sure I get that clipboard, wherever that is, and I'll look for an email for you uh, this afternoon sometime. Before I head home, I'll, I'll send it your way. Okay. Thanks for coming, you all. Yep. Next week, we go into the new flower introductions. So it'll be flowers for two weeks out from Mother's Day. So it'll be fun. Yeah? This guy, how much do you use for one year old? Trees. You know, they've got a formula on it, but really it looks salt and peppered. You look underneath and focus on the drip line, not the trunk. Okay. Focus out where the branches are because that's where all the feeder roots are. Okay. Yeah. that And it'll look salt and peppered out there. Right. You kind of just get it close. It's hard to overdo it. You can always add some more if you think you need it. It's just that the, if the leaves are a little thin and wispy, you could go, oh, I think I want to do it again. In six eight weeks, you can do that. Okay. Yeah, so, six eight weeks. Okay. Yeah, right. Generally, we say every three months do it. Yeah, it's take to, to increase. Two, would you put like a like a cup of it and just kind of? I believe it says two cups per inch of trunk diameter is how the actual okay. uh, uh, label has has been written. And then how much water? Water is not going to matter. Water is a totally different subject. So fertilizer and water don't don't relate because okay. rain, snows. Your irrigation, it's going to break down as we get weather. And we get weather every month of the year here, right? So just that's the beauty of it, just to break down a little bit. Um, when you first put it down. Oh, don't need any water. Just get it down. Just don't need water. Don't worry about water. Nope. Don't worry about water. Cool. Water's going to activate it. Now, I am one of those gardeners where I'm that crazy guy that's it's raining. Mm -hmm. I'm outside fertilizing my stuff because I want to take advantage of the rain to activate it. I don't want to wait. So you could do that, okay. but we always get moisture. Every month we get a rain event, okay. so just get it down. Okay. Nature will do the rest. You're overthinking it. Okay. Yes. The well water. I didn't. Um, I didn't pH catch, level. Yeah, I didn't catch what you said to you. pH levels can be a little higher in wells. I found, yeah. especially out in Chino Valley, it can be real high. The only way to truly know would be to to to. Do a soil test and have a pH. You can tell test the pH really easy. You just see what it is, and once you know, it never changes. It's always the same. It's coming out of the same straw on the ground, so you'll know how to react. Uh, my guess is you're high pH like the rest of us. Uh, just if you're really high, yeah, you got to get creative with more PMOS, more sulfurs to keep them keep okay. them going. Yeah, so I know my house plants too. I know that's there. Yeah, that's another one. Yeah. yeah. Yep, okay. it's okay. not uncommon at all. Okay. Yeah. So last year I did my first raised bed. Nice. And I planted the carrots by seed. They had my carrots when I got it. Oh. <laughs> yeah. How deep is the soil? Or is the soil heavy? Or... It's, it's kind of. Okay.